there's a lot of interesting compounds one can be found in, in nature and those from peyote magic mushrooms and ayahuasca. We now know that uh, it is these three compounds that is responsible for the effects of these uh, compounds. And how do they actually work? What is the sort of the common pharmacological denominator? As Tobias also mentioned, that is that these compounds, they activate the 5-HT2A receptor, or if you want to use more fancy language, then it is that 5-HT2A agonists, they have psychedelic effects. Uh, and perhaps the most sort of uh, convincing piece of evidence for that was a study done by von Weiderbeck in 98, where he did a study where he used psilocybin, and also this ketantrin that you have also heard mentioned uh, many times today, which is a somewhat selective two-way antagonist. So that, whereas the psilocybin turns on the 5 ht 2 a receptor, ketantrin shuts it down. And he did a study where he took uh, four populations of uh, uh, individuals. One of them received placebo, and then he scored them on his this score where he then sort of, did you experience something or not? And then for placebo, this was sort of the, the ground here, and then ketantrin itself does nothing else than placebo something happens with uh, psilocybin, and then sort of the interesting, a really interesting thing is that if you take psilocybin together with contention, well, then you're back at baseline. So contention is able to shut down the effects of psilocybin. And of course, that is a very interesting observation, and many questions can be asked based on that. And one of them could be, so what role does the 5 ht 2 a receptor play, and how would you investigate that? I think many of the studies you've uh, heard uh, in this conference, and also the rest you'll see, is they sort of take, okay, we have Okay, no, that's fine. Um, <clears throat> that you look at, let's say, psilocybin or LSD or DMT or many of the other compounds, and then you ask, what do they do? Well, they do many things, but you could also ask, so the thing that they do, they do that via this receptor. So sh should we look at the receptor or should we look at all the compounds doing the things? Uh, so I think that my interest is more to ask, so what role does this receptor play? And how can we play with this? And how would you investigate what this receptor actually does? And one question that a lot of people have been asking over the years is that what happens if you selectively activate the 5 2 a receptor? All of the interesting imaging things you've seen where people, they are taking LSD and other things, then you look at sort of what's going on in the brain. But if you want to try and sort of zoom in and ask sort of the more detailed biochemical questions is on the thing that LSD does and the thing that psilocybin does, how does it really do it at the molecular level? And whereas LSD is very interesting, it's also a very promiscuous compound. It interacts with a right variety of different uh, receptors. So if you want to understand in detail what's really going on, it's very, very difficult to do that with something like uh, LSD. So we're trying sort of to address this problem that it would be nice if we could be able to selectively activate the 5 2 a receptor, but unfortunately you cannot do that right now because such a compound does not exist. And the reason for we did this kind of research was that some 10 years ago I was mar uh, we, the SIMBI, the Center for Integrated Molecular Brain Imaging, it's headed by Guillermo Knudsen at NRU in Copenhagen, was found and that has been running for the last 10 years or so and we have been asking ourselves a lot of questions and one of the questions we asked us, wouldn't it be nice if we could develop a 5 ht 2 a agonist pet lichen? There are antagonist pet lichens out there but we thought agonist pet lichens would be interesting for reasons I won't go into today. So just 10 seconds of nuclear physics, what is a pet lichen? It's based on this technology and that's basically if you have an unstable isotope of this carbon that will then annihilate or that will then blow up, you could say, and form a positron, which is the positive form of an electron you might have heard of. And if these two guys meet, then they annihilate and send out gam gamma rays. And if you put them into a detector that can detect all of this radiation, then you can find out where, this, where did this happen. And if you then find a way of putting such an unstable isotope into a particular molecule of interest, then you can actually find out where did that molecule blow up, and then you can, in the end, come up with pictures like that. So these colors then tell you, okay, where did the small molecule blow up? And if you make sure you make a compound that binds selectively to the target you want to investigate, and then you say, okay, the compound is there, and if we believe it's sitting at this place, the receptor, then we in principle should be able to see where is the receptor. So, how would you investigate this? Well, a pet lichen that visualized the 5 ht 2 a receptor, that would be a start. I guess that would be nice. And that requires that we begin to play with compounds that should selectively interact with this 5 ht 2 a receptor. So if you can do that, and perhaps we can then take these compounds and modify them slightly, and then actually end up with a compound where we'd be able to selectively activate this receptor. So then the question is, so where to start? Should we then just take this one and investigate mescaline, psilocybin, and some of the others? Well, I also discussed that, well, selectivity is a key issue because 
what we can see is where is the compound. And then it's important that compound interacts selectively with the target we want to investigate and not numerous other uh, receptors. For instance, if you did a PET ligand of something like uh, LSD, you would just see the entire brain lining up. And that might be fun, but not really useful for anything. Um, <clears throat> another very important thing is affinity. You need them to be very sticky. It needs to have very, very high affinity, so we really want to sit and bind to this receptor. And then none of these guys are really that good for that, but mescaline is interesting for the fact it's actually a fairly selective compound, whereas these are not. But uh, one will then try, okay, can we then increase the affinity to make it more sticky and then maintain the selectivity? And if you look at mescaline, which was discovered many years ago, that is a not a very potent compound. But then this guy, I guess most of you heard of, he did some chemistry in his backyard, and he began to modify the structure of mescaline and found, okay, if we take this methoxy group and move it up there, and then if we ch exchange this methoxy group for something else, then we arrive at the 2CX family of compounds. This is an 2CI. And then, many years later, back in 2003, a German PhD student, Ralf Heim, he published it in his thesis, and not in the primary literature, why, no one really knows, and the, the <coughs> Dr. Nichols, he picked up on that and then published it in the primary literature in 2006. And the KI, KI value that says something about affinity, and if you look at the difference here, then we are something like 30,000 times more potent going from mescaline, so something really happened here. And I have to stress that this guy, David Nichols, he has been working for something like 40 years in this area, and he has done a humongous contribution to all of that, and we are really standing on the shoulders of a giant. I will not have time today to show, share you all the great things he's done, but just to say this is by no means something we've done ourselves. We are very much relying on the work of Dr. Nichols. But timing was actually perfect because we, this center was formed back in 2005, and that was about the same time that this compound class appeared on the, in, in the primary literature. So we asked ourselves, this compounds now known as N-bombs, that was the naming done by Ralf Heim. Could we actually use these compounds to investigate the 5 hc 2 a receptor? Because they seem to fit the requirement for being super potent and somewhat selective. So that was sort of the best bet at the time. So in the last 10 years, we investigated numerous of these, and these are just some of the structures I won't go into in the detail. Why we like them is that they have this high affinity and high selectivity, and also for the reasons that we want to be able to put in these um, small, you know, radioactive nucleus that will be, make us able to detect them. So these are these methyl groups for the chemically inclined, and how do we do that? Well, you need access to a lot of hardware, a cyclotron, and so on. And then you can take this at carbon 11, which is the unstable isotope, and you can end up with an N-bomb with one of these unstable isotopes inside. And we do the screening for the ligands that is done in pigs, Danish land race pigs. So this, you can see a pig lying on his back with his head inside this scanner that is able to de detect the radioactive decay. And this is, of course, uh, fully sedated and uh, <coughs> intubated and then hooked up to a lot of equipment so we can monitor, monitor all, all sorts of things with these pigs. Um, and this is an overview of some of the results from these compounds. So what this is a picture of the pig brain, and it's actually looking like this. So it's a sagittal uh, <coughs> here we have the cortex, and back here there's the cerebellum, and it's known that there's a high concentration of the 5 hc 2 a receptor in the cortex, so we would like to see a lot of activity there, and we don't want to see any activity down here. And this is sort of a heat map, so the warmer the colors, the better it is, and I guess you don't really need a PhD to find out which one is the best one, and that's that guy. Uh, and that was then called SIMBI 36, because this was the SIMBI project, and this was compound number 36. In the, on the street, this is probably better known as 25B or 25N bone. And then to make a very, very long story very short, this was then eventually tested in humans. So this is basically the same experiment done with 11, the carbon 11 uh, labeled SIMBI 36 in humans. And here you can see it binds, or you can see the compound is actually sitting uh, in you know, specific parts of the brain in the cortical area, and there's nothing stuck here back in the cerebellum. So that lets us to believe that this is actually specific binding to the 5 hc 2 a receptor. And if you then do a controlling experiment where you then pre-treat these uh, volunteers with cotangent, then you can see the hot stuff is gone, and that leads us to conclude that, well, the reason we see all this, uh, uh, the, the accumulation of the compound over here is because, actually because it has a specific interaction with the 5 hc 2 a receptor. Okay, so in principle, I think one can conclude this, and uh, Gita Mos Knudsen, who's uh, heading this imaging uh, effort, is now running a lot of experiments to try and how can we use this tool to further understand the effect or the role of this 5 h 2 a receptor in humans. But sort of my focus was, okay, could we actually, now we can see, could we actually 
begin to them to, or could we evolve compounds from this compound class that actually could be used to active, selectively activate the 5 HD2 receptor at pharmacological doses, not tracer doses. We're only using that for imaging. And of course, this has to be done some a lot of in vivo ex experiments, but of course, the dream is at the end to try and also do this in humans. First thing that a good PET ligand is not necessarily a good drug and the other way around, because uh, PET ligands, that is a race for affinity, whereas if you want to develop a drug, that is a race towards efficacy. So it's different parameters, so we have to probably have to optimize this. And then there's this little thing that semi-36 is only something like tenfold selective for the 5 ht 2 a receptor over the 5 ht 2 c And that is good enough for imaging purposes, but if we want to say that we have select, or we want to claim that we can selectively activate this 5 ht 2 a receptor, we probably need to go a little bit higher than this. But uh, then again, another thing, when you want to develop a drug or a pharmaceutical, you need to know what happens with the compounds in the body. It's the metabolic stability, there was some mention about this in the previous talk as well, that is a very important parameter, that if you give, give a drug and that is then chopped down in the, in, the, in the liver or in the body by the liver very rapidly, that doesn't work. You need to be in there for a certain amount of time to evoke the pharmacological response. And again, if you read the literature, or whatever we should call Pical, then we can see, that, okay, the different 2 axes, so with different substituents out here, they are active in humans at something like 20 milligrams, depending on the, how big you are and so on, but that's sort of the rough dose. And these end bombs, as I'm sure most of you are aware of, they have seen some widespread recreational use in the last something like five years, and if you read Eurovit Blue Light and Reddit or whatever you look, you can read a lot of uh, reports about people that have been experimenting with these. Um, and one of the things we took notice when they say, well, for instance, it is a very potent compound, so it's active in humans in less than one milligram. And that you know, fits well, that this is, at least from the in vitro data, this is a much more sticky lichen, so it uh, interacts much more potently with the 5 h 2 a receptor than these. So that's, you know, that, that fits nicely. But then there's this small thing that's active in humans via sublingual or buccal administration. So that means that if you put it under your tongue or in your kin, uh, on, on your cheek, then it's active. But it's also in sort of many report that it's inactive in humans after parole administration. And that means dissolving it in orange juice or whatever and drinking it. So if you, from uh, my kind of background, from working in, in the pharmaceutical industry, when you read something like this, then you think first past metabolism. And what that means is that whenever we ingest a compound, the first thing that happens is it goes into the bloodstream and then it's passed through to our liver. That makes sure to get rid of nasty things. So. This led us to speculate that what is actually going on here is that this compound is probably then being metabolized, which could then explain that, well, it's no longer there to give an effect. And if you want to determine something like that, then you look at what is called the intrinsic clearance, which is uh, the volume of blood the liver can cleanse per in the, no, so yeah, that, that is not really important, but it's, if you want to have a good stable compound, that should be something like 0.2 to 0.5, which is lower than you know, the amount of uh, liver, the blood that is going through the liver. And if it's much higher than this, well, then you have a problem. So we decided to have a look at the classic 2CXs from Shulgin and others. And if you look, we took 10 different ones, so 2CI, 2CB, and 2CTFM, and so on. And if you take, excluding 2CH, which has a very high metabolic rate, and that is actually also known not to be orally available, that actually fits nicely, that these are all in sort of the green numbers, that they, based on this, one would predict that these should be orally available, and they are. So that's very nice. And then we took... Again, 10 N-bombs, and that didn't look good. Well, it depends on your perspective, of course. They had a very, very, very high metabolic rate. Some of them, you know, extreme high numbers. It's actually so that the one we're using as a pet ligand, the one with the bromo sitting on there, is actually the most stable of them. And if that has uh, something to do with, I don't know. But okay, the conclusion was that these N-bombs, they are very rapid metabolizers, and that is probably a good explanation why they don't, are not uh, orally available. And if we want to make useful compound from this compound class, this is something we need to fix. Um, so how do we do that? Well, we decided to try and figure out, so how is this compound that is being used as a pet ligand in humans, how is that metabolized? If we can find out where it's being chopped down, then perhaps we can fix that problem. And no, this is going to into a little bit of detail. I'll just walk you through how we did this because I think it's actually quite instructive. So given the fact we had access to do experiments both in pigs and also in humans at tracer doses, we decided both to, to do a sort of in vitro study. So that means putting the compounds into a vial and taking some liver enzymes from both human and pigs and see what happened. And I know this is extremely busy, but this is basically the compound. And then we could detect in all 16 different metabolites. That means that either the pig enzymes or the human enzymes 
began to cutting away at the compounds in different places. If you look at the blue one, that is from PIC, then there is a major one here, so that means that that is actually M12, so the pig liver enzymes likes to eat away the molecule down here, whereas in humans that looked a lot more you know, diverse, that there was formed something like four or five major metabolites. But again, this is just in a, in, a, in a dish. Eventually, we would like to see what goes on in vivo. So we did that. We took a pig and a fully sedated one, gave it a pharmacological dose, it was two milligrams to a some 20, gram, uh, 20 kilogram pig, collect some blood samples, analyze these by LCMSMS, and we also did a synthesis of all the reference compounds to make sure that the structural assignments we did, they were not just guesswork, but they, they're actually okay. So based on the in vitro, we, in vitro data, we were expecting this compound to be chopped down over here, and if we look, first of all, how, far, how long does this survive in, the, in this uh, pl the plasma level of the compounds, over time, we can see that this is rapidly removed from the bloodstream, so very, very fast metabolism. And as we were expecting from this phase one metabolism, we can actually see this one being formed, and then we looked at the prevalence of that in the plasma, we could also see that was being formed, but that also disappeared very rapidly. So this disappears into something that disappears again. So yeah, something more must be going on. And then that's what is called a phase two metabolism. And this strange thing is being put on and that is called glucuronidation. And that is something the body does to increase the aquasolubility of compounds. So whenever you ingest something that the body doesn't like, it likes to come up with a way of getting rid of it. And a good way of doing that is via the urine. So it takes a fatty, greasy molecule and it turns into something that's very water soluble so that this will be removed from plasma go into the bladder and eventually uh, gone by the urine. And if we looked at how much of this one, we can see that builds up rapidly as this is decayed and you can see it peaks here and then it begins to go down again, presumably because it's being removed from the plasma going into the urine. And if we collect the three here, because the scales were different, you can see this one disappears very rapidly, the starting one. We barely see this one, that's here, the cross is down here, but this one builds up. And if you look something like at the 30 minute mark, you can see Already at this point, after 30 minutes, we have twice as much as the phase two metabolite as we have with the starting compound. So this is really being chopped down very fast. And then we did some pet experiments in pigs because we would like to do this in humans afterwards. We can do human studies in tracer doses, not a pharmacological doses. So we wanted to check this in pigs first. And so we took this one, which is the one that is being used to image the 5 2 receptor in humans. And if you look at the metabolism of that one, we would expect to be forming this one as well. And just for the sake of overview, I'll just cut this down and call it glue as a glucuronide. And this is then an HPLC tramp sample from uh, one of the plas from a plasma uh, sample taken from a pig. So this is time out here and up here we have radioactivity. And this one out here, we know this is the retention time of the metabolite because we have an authentic sample of that one. And that fits nicely, as you can see, well, the reason why we can detect this over here, because this is radioactivity, we have this carbon 11 sitting on it, so we can see this is the compound. And then we began to play a little bit around, and okay, let's move the side of labeling over here. In principle, we should get the same compound. It's now labeled in a different position. But if we are right, we should get the same HPLC chromatogram over here, and we did. And then we moved it to the side of metabolism down here. Again, we'd expect exactly the same to happen. But now this one no longer has one of these carbon 11 sitting on it. And that means we should not be able to detect it. And we did not see a peak. And then the last experiment was to take this one. And this is sort of the phase one metabolite. So in principle, this one should be chopped down to this one and then chopped into this one. So if you're right, then this spectrum here should look like the two others. And fortunately it did. So we are pretty sure we know what's going on. And if we then go back and look at some of the symmetry studies that was done in pigs in order to be allowed to do the human studies. So this is a picture of a pig lying on its side like this. And this is then football scans of this carbon 11 labeled at different time intervals. So in the first seven minutes, seven to 20 minutes and so on. So we can monitor the distribution of the pet ligand over time in the pig. So what we have been looking for so far, I know that is what is in the brain, which is of course the most interesting to us. And then we can see over time, then the sort of the signal decays off. There's high uptake in the lungs. You often see that for pet ligands, but what is also interesting to see this guy down here, that is the liver. And that is the liver who is busy trying to chop this one down into this one. And then you can see the activity in the liver also drops off. And then you can see down here, which is the bladder. And actually here after the latest time, time point, we can see most, if not all of the activity is now sitting uh, in, the, in the bladder, which to us is a clear indication that the, all of this has now been turned into this. And then the question comes, okay, what well then happens when we go from pig to humans? Because we can also do these, uh, tra these pet experiments in humans. And this is, again, a little bit busy, I apologize. But what we can see from the same plasma samples in humans is that they build up 
of this one down here. So this is being metabolized in the same way. And if we then move the side of labeling and put it down here, then we, no longer, we are no longer able to take this one. It is formed, but it no longer has this gamma 11 label sitting on it. So we see very, very small amounts of that. Uh, and gratifying also that the in vitro data sort of in, uh, suggested that the metabolism should be much more complex in humans than in pig, but it actually looks like it's f more, more or less identical. So what is the next step? How to proceed from here? Well, is this sort of a general n bound metabolism? And there's a lot of people around the world that are looking into the metabolism of this. Uh, we are also doing this a little bit, but, but for us, the most interesting question is, could we develop ligands that are more stable based on this? So now we know how they're being broken down. Can we fix that? So the pro approach we have been taking in recent time is, to, okay, let's see if we can play around with the structure down here and then perhaps make something that's much more stable. And the short answer is no, we cannot. Uh, we can still make compounds that are relatively potent, but we have not been able to fix sort of the, the met metabolic issue yet. So I won't show you any of the data. And I think this is such an inherent problem with this compound class. They're based simply too lipophilic. The enzymes or the liver just loves molecules like that. There's nothing more they would like to do than to chop down something like that. So the last two minutes or so, I would like to show some other data that we have. You know, can we actually then begin to fit around with these uh, compounds and perhaps make selective compounds? Um, so this is a matter of sort of fishing for selectivity. And again, David Nichols has done enormous amount of work here, and he has been working on trying to do some conformational restriction, these compounds to try and lock them in the bioactive conformation. Uh, we have been doing similar things, failed to do so. And then I guess at some point we, de we decided that we're, perhaps we're not that smart. Perhaps we should just do a lot of things and then hope we get lucky. So what we did was to take 12 known 2CXs, that's uh, based on Shulgin's work and Nichols' work, and then there's this trick that uh, Ralf Heimi came up with. If you put another thing out here on the nitrogen, then perhaps they get more potent. And if you take 12 of these and four of these and you make them all, then you end up with 40 ligands. And then perhaps we get lucky. So this shows the affinity data towards 5HC2A in relationship to 5HC2C. So these, all these boxes here represent a compound. And for those of you who are into chemistry, then you can begin to get an idea what is the structure here. And again, I don't think you need a PhD to find out which of these compounds are standing out. It is the long green bar here, which for some reason that we still don't understand. We have been looking at this data many, many times and trying to understand it. This just turns out to be the most selective one we've ever found. And that is, again, depending on your choice of radio ligands, roughly 100% select, 100 fold selective for 2A over 2C, both in the binding and the functional data. So that is sort of our favorite compound at the moment. And if you compare that with DOI, which is also sort of a standard ligand used in basic research, that is much more moderate uh, with respect to selectivity for 2A over 2C. So this one has also been CAM11 labeled, and we saw a uh, the brain uptake of this compound in Tupic, so that is, it rapidly goes into the brain. It has been through what we call sort of broad screens, it's something that a company called Serup and the PDSP, the Psychiatric Drug Screening Program. Uh, and which says that it has an eligible affinity for other targets in the 5 ht family, so 2A, 2B, and 2C. And for some reason, we also got extremely lucky with respect to the metabolic stability. It is by far the most stable of these compounds we've seen so far. It's still perhaps a little bit in the high end, but now we're beginning to get into an area where this becomes reasonable to do in vivo uh, investigations with this compound. So the question would be, okay, it works in vitro, but what about in animals? Uh, so is this a functionally active 5 h 2 a agonist in vivo? And then Tobias, the previously mentioned, there were these three ways one could uh, investigate that. That was this head twitch response, and it has uh, the drug disc discrimination and this hypothermia. Well, a professor, William Fanzagrossi, at the University of Arkansas, he has been using these animal models to study that, and he has published a very interesting paper where he looked at DOI. And up here you have the number of head twitches, so that means that the mice shake their head, and if you go up in doses of DUI, that is the, block, uh, the, the dark ones here, you can see with increasing doses, then you get an, an increasing number of head twitches, that makes sense. But if you increase the dose even more, you, I guess you would expect to have a higher effect even more, but it actually begins to drop down. And then people also say, okay, that is perhaps these mice are now beginning to experience something and they're just sitting in a corner enjoying life. But that is actually not the case. It is because, or at least Fantagrossi, he has shown that that is 
given the fact that these compounds are unselective 2A over 2C, the coactivation of 2C shuts down this uh, response. Then what he did was to co-administer a 5HC2C selective antagonist with increasing doses. And then you can see by in co-administering those, you're actually able to right shift this curve. So doses with DOI gives rise to higher number of head twitches if you co-administer the 2C antagonist, meaning that you shut down on that one. So we contacted him and asked if he would be willing to have a look at this compound, and he accepted. And this, what's the data? What happened? Well, this is the same curve as you saw before with DUI, so the same effect increase, and then a rapid decline in the effect. Our compound 25C and NBOH, well, we see a slow, as, uh, not, not as a potent effect. And for us, what is uh, more interesting is you see the decline in the effect is not as steep as over here. And we interpret that as because they, we don't see this concomitant activation of the 5 hc 2 a receptor. And also, if you co-administer a 5 hc 2 c antagonist, you don't see this jump in activity that you saw with DOI, given this is really, really high doses and something else could be going on. But if we also had co-activation of 2C here, I guess we would expect to see this one move on. And so what is this effect, the, the head twitch? How is that mediated? And if you then co-administer a selective 5 hc 2 a antagonist, then you can see you're, actually, you're able to completely shut down the head twitch response. So we feel fairly confident that this is this effect, this head twitch, is mediated by the 5 hc 2 a receptor. And then he also did this drug discrimination. So basically you ask an animal, or you train it to recognize a particular compound, and then you give it another one, and then you ask it, do you think it's the same or not? Uh, so this is, if you train an animal on DOI, and it is a matter of a lever response, so it goes and taps a lever and tells you, yes, you gave me DOI, no, you just gave me saline. And then animals trained on DOI, then it was given our compound here, and then you can see, so the, the mice that answered, well, I'm not really sure what you gave me. Um, if it has been just a no, you know, total perfect result, would see that would be that the curve would be lying just here. Over here, we're getting, we're getting to get a little bit suspicious to actually see a response. But if you then co-administer a 2A selective antagonist, then you get an even lower response. So you see, there is some activity. It is not the same as saline. It's somewhere in between. So again, what is that? And the result of, I guess, you can interpret that in a number of different ways. I can say there are others that are beginning to use this compound. This is a, a paper published by the Helperstadt lab. Uh, they did it in another strain of mice, and they were also able to reproduce this head twitch response. And they did some other uh, experiments on what's called temporal discrimination, so that this warped sense of time, they are actually able to reproduce the effect of psychedelics, this uh, cha change in perception of time, and showed that this compound actually had a statistically significant effect of these mice's ability to assess time. So, so far, this is the best we've got. Hopefully, we'll get better, but. If there's anyone sitting out here, or you know or anyone that would be interesting to do any kind of research of this one, give me a buzz, and I'll happy to send, uh, send you something to it. You talk is also selling it at an extremely high price, or you can send me an email, I'll send it to you for free. Uh, most important slide acknowledgements, what I've shown you here today, has been the collective effort of a great number of extremely talented people. A lot of people have been involved in the synthesis of the compounds, metabolism, the pharmacological evaluation, both in vitro and in vivo, all of the imaging, the radiochemistry, uh, some people from industry that helps us, uh, NIH, uh, PDSP for testing, and of course, a lot of people for funding all of this. And then, of course, you for listening, and I'll be happy to try and answer any question you might have. Um, thank you. Um, do you think that the dosage, because uh, you're talking about uh, using this in humans as well, do you think that the dosage you would require in humans to get a decent si signal on the PET scan uh, would be more or less or perhaps equal to uh, what most people would consider the recreational dose? of these uh, yeah. compounds? To, when doing the human studies, um, you, uh, the, the, so you're talking about how much compound you administer to the humans. Yeah, there is a limit to how much you can give. That is 1.5 micro micrograms. So it's usually below one microgram. And if you look at the doses people they report for these, then you have to be you know, close to one gram. So we are several hundred folds away from these. And from all the people, I, I don't know exact number, I think it's close to 100 people that have been through these scans, and none of them have reported any sort of you know, experience. So you don't, you don't feel the pharmacology of the compound when you do it. Yes. Thank you. Yeah.
in the drug uh, discrimination study you did with uh, with the rats, uh, you, they train, were trained for DOI, but that has a, also a significant affinity for the 2C. So the fact that the rats weren't sure, could it be that they maybe try to recognize the 2C effect? I would love to ask them, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, again, this is all very preliminary stuff. No, and a lot more work needs to be done before we can you know, say something definite about this. So usually you would expect that to other 2A compounds, when you do doctor's discrimination, then they say, okay, this feels like DOI. So if you do DMT or other things, then they would say, oh, you just give me DOI, even though it was DMT. So it doesn't feel like DOI to the red, apparently. But the way to check that is uh, administer DOI with a 2C antagonist. Then you could see if they are trained for the 2C effect. Ah, yeah. Perhaps. That could be, yeah. I'm not an in vivo pharmacologist. Me neither. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so two questions. Firstly, in the, um, the ETRIP paper that you showed the slide with the, um, the pig brain and the yeah. uptake, um, if I recall correctly, the, um, the 36 compound doesn't have that much more remarkable affinity for 2A. Nope. So do you think that that's a function of pharmacokinetics or... Um, Blood brain permeability or something Last like that. One. That is brain, brain uptake is you know that is uh, so we're talking about this one. Yeah. Yeah. In principle, one of the one of the most potent two A agonists out there is this guy up here, and that is you know very much more potent than something like two CI. But even for that reason, though, I think it's something like a, at least a thousand-fold difference in affinity. But as you see, this one actually shows higher brain uptake than this one over here. And that is simply because this, for some reason, is not being let into the brain by the pig. And we've done, again, if you go back a little we still don't understand this. You can do very, very small changes to the structure of the compounds, and it has dramatic effect on their ability to pass into the brain. And we're still trying to understand that. And just quickly, secondly, um, do you think you're going to try the confirmationally restricted version of the cyano compound to see if you can increase the selectivity even further? Yeah, so you mean huncosamine that was made by Nichols? Yeah, we are we're yeah. working on the synthesis on that one. Okay, thanks. Thank you for your excellent talk. Uh, i just like to ask one question. All of these compounds, they are extremely potent in humans. DOB, DOI, and BOM, all variants are almost equipotent, and some are, some are even more potent than LSD. Uh, however, they also show some signs of toxicity, and people can die from them. And yeah. there's no, no known, to my knowledge, mechanism why they die. But we did some studies with 2CB, and we did some microdialysis studies, and we can find out changes in the monoamine levels that might correspond that it might block also monoamine oxidases. Have you any idea if these compounds have been ever evaluated for the activity on monoamine oxidases and if that might be the cause of the acute toxicity or what's the cause of the acute toxicity? Well, we have also been asked ourselves that question and it appears that you know, th th from those something like 20 deaths that have been recorded worldwide from using these end bombs, it appears that there's, there's some element of vasoconstriction in that. And for all the in vivo experiments that have been done so far, we haven't seen that apart from in one case that was the pig that was used and that was a very high dose, but we saw the opposite. Instead of vasoconstriction, we saw a drop in blood pressure and we saw a drop in, uh, in pulse. So it was actually going in the other direction. And we've also been studying the, the pharmacology of, let me see if I can remember now. So that was also one of our sort of ideas that, okay, perhaps it's not this guy who's toxic, but it's some of the metabolites. That could be, given the fact that they're chewed down so fast that perhaps this one is safe and then this one is bad and this is perhaps even worse. So the in vitro pharmacology of this one is roughly the same as this one. This is also a very potent um, 5 2 2 agonist. This one we presume is dead because this is this one sitting on here. And we've also done in vivo pharmacological evaluation of these two and it actually turns out this is much less potent. And the reason for that, we believe, is that we know from the data on the carbon 11 label on this, the brain exposure of this one is much lower. So even, you have some, even if you have high levels of this one in blood, which you apparently don't, this doesn't really do anything. So it's a, uh, I don't know. Yeah. Well, that's, I'm asking because I also remember one case of DOP overdose, which happened in our country. One mm -hmm. subject died, the other survived. They both had signs of brain edema and convulsions that lasted for about a week. Yep. One of them died because they took, they, uh, took it as MDMA. They just switched the vials. 
and they took like 50 milligrams of DOP. Uh, so that's why they died. But uh, yeah, there were signs of uh, signs of brain edema and convulsions, which yeah. could be relate, related to serotonin syndrome as well. So that's the question. Yeah, but then it's also strange. There are some again anecdotal reports of people that have been taking you know very 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 large doses of 2CB, which is less selective and surviving. So these are more selective, but apparently more toxic, which, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, speakers, thanks the audience, and please go to the ice cream for posters.